year is 1911. A young American explorer named Hiram Bingham, a professor of history at Yale University, hacks his way through dense jungles in southeastern Peru, following vague rumors of a lost city hidden deep in the jungles of the Andes. But as Bingham struggles on, it seems like an impossible dream. Above him are 9,000-foot peaks. Before him, the deadly torrents of the Urubamba River. Yet Bingham perseveres. On the morning of July 24th, he crosses the river, crawling on hands and knees over a primitive log bridge. Then, guided by a local Indian, he begins to climb up a nearly vertical mountain. By afternoon, he is among the clouds on a narrow ridge which runs along the mountain's top. The natives call this ridge the Great Peak. In their language, Machu Picchu. And on that ridge, Hiram Bingham makes one of the most incredible archaeological discoveries of all time. In the dense shadow, hiding in bamboo thickets and tangled vines, appeared walls of white granite, carefully cut and exquisitely fitted together, as fine as the finest stonework in the world. Suddenly, we found ourselves standing in front of the finest and most interesting structures in ancient America. It seemed like an unbelievable dream. What could this place be? Would anyone believe what I had found? Machu Picchu, built on a remote and nearly inaccessible mountaintop, far from water and other settlements. A cloud-shrouded enigma 8,000 feet up. The beauty of its 200 magnificent stone structures captivates all who behold it. I don't know of any other place in the world where the man-made and the natural come together with a beauty that is really astounding. Five centuries ago, hundreds of people lived here, but why they lived here and what they did here remains the central mystery of this city in the sky. I wish I knew how Machu Picchu was used, what the functions were of the various places, how people experienced it themselves. What were they doing there? That is what really I would love to know. After Hiram Bingham found Machu Picchu, he rushed back to America to announce his incredible discovery to the world and to organize an expedition. In 1912, his work crews began stripping away centuries of jungle growth from Machu Picchu's ruins. Bingham took the world's first photos of the city that came to light. Forty rows of farming terraces hugged the steep mountainside, each over 10 feet high, all linked together by some 3,000 stone steps. There were whole neighborhoods of what appeared to be homes and workshops, and exquisite buildings that Bingham called temples. There were sculpted rocks, so strange and beautiful, they evoked forgotten rites and the unknown gods of the high Andes. And everywhere he dug, Bingham found huge stones, some of them as big as 12 feet high, fitted together with an ancient skill that seemed unexplainable. 
I could scarcely believe my senses as I examined the larger blocks and estimated that they must weigh from 10 to 15 tons each. Nothing like them in design and execution has ever been found. Hiram Bingham. Over the years that followed, Bingham and other archaeologists excavated five square miles of ruins at Machu Picchu. Today, the place they uncovered has become one of the most popular tourist destinations in the world. Every year, thousands of people travel to Peru to marvel at Machu Picchu's magnificent stonework and its stupendous setting. Most are ordinary tourists. They wander the ruins, listen to guides, take pictures, and go home. But there are others who come to Machu Picchu not just to see, but to feel. They too reflect the mystery of this place. They are the seekers of a new, more spiritual age. To them, Machu Picchu is Rome, Mecca, and Jerusalem all rolled into one, one of the most sacred spots on planet Earth. I find it hard to believe that anybody could come to Machu Picchu and not be opened up, not be moved. Uh, it's, it's far more than just a, an architectural, archaeological wonder. There's a sense of eternity here that is just remarkable. And I've experienced that in, in cathedrals or other religious-type temples, but never to the depth and the, the extent that I have here. When I've touched some of the rocks, I've burst into tears. There's, um, I don't understand it in a logical way, but there's a tremendous, powerful energy here. There is a draw to this site that comes from within, and you don't want to leave. It opens up parts of your soul that you forgot, and it helps you in your day-to-day -day life uh, so that you can grow and further yourself. The mystery of Machu Picchu is etched in the faces of the people who live in the Andes today. The direct descendants of those who built Machu Picchu so long ago, the Incas. The Incas called themselves the Children of the Sun, the all-powerful god they worshipped as the source of light and life. In their ancient traditions, the sun sent his beloved son and daughter to bring civilization to the earth. The Incas believed they were the descendants of this primordial couple. High in the Andes, they built their capital city in the place they called the navel of the universe. In the Inca language, Cusco. It is believed that the Incas began farming in the Cusco area sometime during the 12th century. At first, they were no more powerful than other small tribes living in the Andes. But the Incas were destined to go far beyond their humble origins. They would create one of the biggest empires and greatest civilizations of the New World, whose crowning glory was Machu Picchu. But today we know more about Inca civilization than we do about Machu Picchu itself. I think that an enormous amount remains to be learned about Machu Picchu. Uh, we'd, we would like to know who lived at the site, where they came from, what they did while they lived there, um, what their experiences were like, what the particular ceremonies that were carried out there were. I think by eliminating many of the distracting and mystifying theories concerning Machu Picchu, we finally set the stage for a real scientific understanding of Machu Picchu and the Inca Empire that created it.
The empire that created Machu Picchu would one day be destroyed. Not long after the Incas finished building Machu Picchu, the shadow of Spanish conquistadores was falling across their land. It was a shadow that would plunge the brilliant Inca civilization into darkness and turn Machu Picchu from a proud city into a place of silence and secrets as it still is today. When we return, we will penetrate Machu Picchu's haunting silence and fathom what we can of its mysteries. We are about to meet the ancient builders of this magnificent city above the clouds who conquered half a continent and ruled as mighty emperors until the swords and guns of Spain forced them into a new religion and drowned their ancient glory in a river of blood. At the heart of Machu Picchu's mystery lies the people who built it. They were the Incas, one of the most remarkable peoples of the New World. Hiram Bingham, discoverer of Machu Picchu, thought the city might have been a place where sacred virgins were dedicated to the Inca gods. He even thought it was possible that Machu Picchu might have been the Inca's last capital, but he wasn't able to prove it. All that is known is that 500 years ago, when Machu Picchu was built, the Incas ruled most of Western South America until Spanish conquistadores destroyed their vast empire. But today, the Incas proudly keep alive the memory of their ancient past. Once a year, in the city of Cusco, some 50 miles from Machu Picchu, the Incas celebrate the festival of Corpus Christi at the winter solstice. Visitors from around the world gather to watch as groups of men bring giant images of the Christian saints from Cusco's cathedral into the main square. Making their way slowly around the square, the men struggle to carry the statues, which can weigh more than a ton. The Corpus Christi procession is a solemn rite of the Catholic Church which centuries ago outlawed the Inca's native religion and forced them to become Christians. So why do the Incas celebrate Corpus Christi with such fervor today? Long before the conquistadores made them Catholics, the Incas carried sacred mummies of their ancestral rulers around Cusco's main square. This was a celebration of the new year. Since the Catholic Church could not destroy this ancient ritual, the church Christianized it by turning the Inca mummies into saints. Perhaps that's why the Incas celebrate Corpus Christi with such devotion and pride. It represents a precious link with the glory and greatness of their past, the long ago days when they were masters of their world. Today in Cusco, there is still impressive evidence of just how powerful and sophisticated they became. Much of the city still rests on huge granite walls built 500 years ago by Inca stonemasons. Clearly, they were brilliant artisans who could shape and fit huge stones together with uncanny precision. But the Incas started out as simple Andean farmers how did they transform themselves into such accomplished craftsmen? And how did they become the lords of a mighty empire which could build a magnificent capital like Cusco and an incredible city like Machu Picchu? No one fully understands how Inca emperors of the 15th century were able to lead armies out of the Andes and conquer vast territories but conquer they did. By the end of the 15th century, the Incas ruled an area stretching from what is now Colombia in the north 
to present-day Chile in the south. Look at the size of the thing. If the Inca Empire could be lifted and moved, it would reach from New York City to the Panama Canal. How do people who didn't have horses, who didn't have any form of written message sending, put together an organization which coordinated a number of people on the order of 12 million? The Inca expansion may have been a response to a threat from a rival people called the Shankas. When the Shankas attacked and all seemed lost, a great Inca leader arose to meet the challenge. As the Chancas, their rivals, had actually burst through and seemed to be within a hair of seizing once and for all the dominion over Cusco and its valley, a prince who later became known as Pachacuti roused a group of military detachments, fought off the Chanca. Pachacuti Inca went on to become the most dynamic single ruler that the Inca state had. He was an extraordinary leader who transformed his people from an obscure Andean tribe into a great empire. But he would have been worthy of his name had he done nothing more than leave us the extraordinary beauty of Machu Picchu. The question is, did he? After saving Cusco, Pachacuti led his armies into wars of conquest, which brought other peoples under Inca rule for the first time. But it was one thing to conquer a huge empire, and quite another to keep control of it. Pachacuti and those who have succeeded him solved this problem in an original way. Unlike many European empires, which inclined toward ideas of sweeping away pre-existing structure and remaking the human landscape, the Incas tended to leave in place, not to humiliate, but rather to honor and exalt the princes that they had overcome. Yes, tribute was required. Yes, gifts were asked, but always asked. And when they were given, something was always given back. But the gentle hand was balanced by a steel fist. The Incas made their power stick by building massive stone fortresses throughout their empire. The strongest of these was Sacsayhuaman, which defended Cusco itself. Sacsayhuaman's zigzagging walls were built of enormous stones, some of them 15 feet tall and 6 feet wide. The Incas' enemies may well have been intimidated by this incredible feat of military engineering. Well, the first time I saw Sacsayhuaman, I was overwhelmed by the sheer size of the structure. It is mind-defying to see a structure that was almost 300 meters long, built of these huge stones stacked on top of each other. But there is also great beauty at Sacsayhuaman, a beauty worthy of the people who left us Machu Picchu. I'm also very much moved by the way the structures fit into the landscape. And I think that's particularly powerful at Sacsayhuaman, but it can be seen at Machu Picchu or any Inca site, really. The stonework. The whole architecture is an interplay between nature and the man-made, one accentuating the other. Could Machu Picchu, high on its remote mountaintop, have been another Inca fortress? Early Spanish chronicles tell us that Inca emperor Pachacuti led his armies into the jungle gorges where Machu Picchu was built not long after he saved his people from the Chanca invaders. But many who have felt the spiritual power of Machu Picchu believe that only peaceful motives could have brought nature and architecture together here as nowhere else on Earth. Machu Picchu is the birthing ground 
of a people that at one time understood what it was to be humble and to walk a path that did not require destruction. The Incas not only had a deep understanding of what it was to live in harmony with nature, they also had a deep understanding of what it was to have nature live in harmony with us. The idea that Incas were peaceful, philosophical, unwarlike, and at the same time empire builders really is not an idea that came out of the early moments of the conquest. The Spaniards found out pretty soon that Incas were able to knock heads just like any other empire builders. Were the Incas a people of peace or dedicated to war? Why did they build their city in the clouds? While visitors to Machu Picchu ponder such questions, the sunlight and shadow that cross its stones reveal some intriguing clues. The Incas were sun worshippers. Could Machu Picchu have been a solar observatory? Was this extraordinary building actually a New World Stonehenge? Or was the Incas' beautiful city a place of human sacrifice? Here, in the southern hemisphere, June is a winter month, the time of the winter solstice, the shortest days of the year. And each year, as the winter solstice approaches, modern Cusco prepares to relive its past. The Church of Santo Domingo once again becomes an Inca temple, as in days of old. And once again, the Inca emperor and his people offer homage to their ancient solar god. It is time to celebrate Inti Raymi, the great festival of the sun. The Inti Raymi was banned by the Catholic Church until the 1940s. Since then, tourists from around the world have flocked to Cusco to witness its revival. At the ancient fortress of Sacsayhuaman, the emperor's courtiers carry him to his throne. Today's Incas reenact all that is left of their ancient solar worship, whose last days were witnessed by a young Spanish priest more than 400 years ago. As soon as the sunrise began, they started to chant in splendid harmony and unison. They all stayed there chanting from the time the sun rose until the time it set. And as the sun was sinking completely and disappearing from sight, they made a great act of reverence, raising their hands and worshiping it in deepest humility. Father Cristobal de Molina, 1536. Was the Inti Raymi once performed at Machu Picchu? Many scholars think so. But once each year, at the winter solstice, the same time of year as the Inti Raymi, Machu Picchu gently reveals one of its secrets. On the precise day of the winter solstice, the first rays of the rising sun enter a window in one of Machu Picchu's most beautiful structures a building called the Torreon, the tower. Inside the Torreon is a single great stone which is struck at dawn by the rays of the rising sun. At the winter solstice, the rays of the sun line up perfectly with a straight line that the Incas chiseled into the rock. Many scholars believe that the Torreon was a temple dedicated to the Inca's most powerful deity whose worship dominated their lives, the sun. The sun was one of the most important entities for the Inca. They believed that they were the sons of the sun or the embodiment uh, of the sun and their ancestors were, 
were the sun and moon. The Inca at Machu Picchu would have selected that site and watched year after year how the sun moved along the horizon during the year. And for the Inti Raymi ceremony on the June solstice, they would have noted where that position was and marked the temple at that location. Other Inca sun rituals may have taken place at Machu Picchu's most puzzling and perhaps its most beautiful artifact, the exquisitely carved rock called the Inti Huatana, a name meaning the hitching post of the sun where the Incas tied up the setting sun they feared would disappear forever. In point of fact, we do not know what that sculpture is and we don't know that it's function. Calling it the hitching post of the sun is simply a piece of mythology that has been generated about it. But for those who are more mystically inclined, there is no doubt about the Intihuatana's sacred purpose. The Intihuatana as a ceremonial place allows both the hitching of the physical sun and the hitching of the spiritual sun to rotate in a prescribed order, come into alignment on certain sacred moments for there to be a lift, a quantum leap in consciousness for the people. But the Incas also seem to have had a darker side to their religion, a side hidden from the bright rays of the sun. This dead child, perfectly preserved by the dry climate of the Andes, was one of many children offered each year to Inca gods. The Incas believed that sacrificing humans not only preserved their empire, but guaranteed long life to the emperor. Only physically perfect children from the finest families were selected for sacrifice. The victims were honored by the emperor himself before priests led them to their deaths. We know that people, sometimes children, were taken as offerings to the tops of the mountains and left there to be exposed and to die in place. For the Inca and other Andean people, the mountains were worshipped as spirits. The mountain spirits are powerful beings to be appeased and human sacrifice was part of that ritual. Even though children were sacrificed throughout the Inca Empire, evidence of child sacrifice at Machu Picchu has yet to be found. Ever since Hiram Bingham discovered Machu Picchu, the world has been entranced by the stunning beauty of its location and by its astonishing stonework. And archaeologists have wondered why the Incas chose such a difficult and dangerous spot to build their architectural masterpiece, a faraway mountaintop where no one had ever lived before. It's in an area where you do not have an immediately available source of water, um, it's in an area where you have to bring many of the resources you would need up very steep slopes in order to provision the site. It's located in an area which was not heavily settled prior to the Inca occupation. And it was also an area that's located on the edge of the Inca Empire. So that they also had to worry about its vulnerability to attack. In the end, what drove the Incas to build in such a remote spot may have been nothing more than their love for the place itself. The site of Machu Picchu was probably picked in part for its beauty. The same qualities that we admire in Machu Picchu, the landscape, the vegetation, the topography, the view, all of those features existed in Inca times and we know that the Incas were great connoisseurs of highland beauty. But even if the Incas were as moved as we are by Machu Picchu's soaring beauty, how could they have managed to build a city there? Today we can see that building stone is plentiful at the site. But how could ancient craftsmen, with only stone tools, carve these huge blocks of granite into such exquisite shapes? How could a people with no wheels or pulleys lift them 10 feet into the air? Clues to how the Incas built cities have been found in early Spanish chronicles, which speak of thousands of Indians pushing huge stones into position up sloping earthen ramps. 
While there is evidence for ramps to bring stones up along a wall and into position, there are many places, particularly at Machu Picchu, where there is no room for such ramps because the walls are very close to precipices. So I really don't know how the stones were brought there. Questions remain about how the Incas lifted the stones of Machu Picchu. But scholars are beginning to understand how they used simple rock hammers to shape stone into timeless beauty. If I hit it straight on, I don't produce much more than dust. However, by giving the hammer a twist in the very moment of impact, I do increase the angle at which I hit the rock, and that tears off flakes. As you can see, it is a reasonably fast operation. It doesn't really take long to get a face smooth like that. Whatever stone they picked up had a shape, and they would cut parts of it to fit to the next stone. They would start a wall, cut the stone to fit, and leave the top of the stones uncut. They take another stone that has already a shape, and they would carve out that part of the lower course to fit the other stone. They carved whatever was necessary out of the stones already set to accept the next stone. Slowly, scholars are filling in pieces of the Machu Picchu puzzle. They now believe the city was built around the year 1450, a time when other great monuments were being constructed around the world. In Italy, the brilliant architect Brunelleschi was completing the graceful dome of Florence's cathedral, a masterpiece of the Italian Renaissance. In the Pacific, the people of Easter Island were erecting gigantic human figures, one of archaeology's enduring enigmas. And in China, the Ming Dynasty had just finished building the Temple of Heaven, where the emperors prayed for good harvests and conversed with their gods. Today, Machu Picchu rivals these other architectural marvels, but incredible as it may seem, scholars believe it was not one of the Inca Empire's important cities. Cusco was quite a large city, even by European standards uh, for the 16th century. However, at Machu Picchu, there were, was only a population which at its peak would have been in the hundreds, perhaps something, something in the order of five or six hundred, and perhaps during much of the year were, was substantially less than that. So in fact, it was a, a fairly small town. I believe that the site was a royal estate, and that it was, in a sense, a place that the Inca elite would go to get away from Cusco in order to spend an enjoyable set of weeks or months uh, at a time when the weather was unfavorable up in the capital. So they would have picked a place that they found particularly attractive, much in the way today people pick resorts that are located along the beach. Was Machu Picchu a playground for the emperor and his court? Or was it a solemn center of worship, as so many believe? Perhaps it was both. For the Incas, Sacred and profane were parts of one harmonious whole, and worship was a part of daily life. I think if we were to go back in time and try to imagine what life was like at Machu Picchu, what we'd see would depend on what season we were visiting. If we were visiting during the season when it was unpleasant in Cusco, and when the royal families were visiting Machu Picchu, we would probably see a daily life filled with all sorts of pomp, with frequent banquets being given, with people drinking corn beer, probably dancing. And then we'd also see at the same time in other portions of the town, 
religious ceremonies going on by people of the priestly group who would be carrying out um, ceremonies related to perhaps astronomical observations or to various types of sacrifices that had to be made. Machu Picchu is slowly yielding its secrets to painstaking research. But one of its most puzzling questions remains unsolved. Scholars believe that by the early 16th century, a mere 50 years after it was finished, Machu Picchu was no longer inhabited. Why did the Incas work so hard to build such a beautiful city and then suddenly abandon it? When we return, we will relive the tragic events that may have doomed Machu Picchu, the dreaded arrival of Spanish conquistadores from across the sea. The year is 1532. The Incas are the undisputed masters of Western South America, the rulers of more than 10 million people. Their empire is over 2,000 miles long and nearly 100 years old. As they did each new year, the Incas asked their gods to bless them and to grant them a vision of the future. It is possible that they foresaw their own doom. An ancient Inca prophecy foretold that a race of unknown people would someday destroy the empire. This year, the prophecy would come true. In 1532, 40 years after Columbus discovered the New World, the Spanish adventurer Francisco Pizarro lands on the coast of Peru. He is searching for El Dorado, the fabled land of gold. Pizarro commands 180 men against 200,000 Inca warriors, but he has weapons the Incas cannot even imagine. Horses, steel swords and lances, muskets and cannon. And the Spaniards have already sent a deadly infiltrator ahead. Probably the most important factor in the Spanish defeat of the Incas um, were the epidemics that had begun to sweep the Inca Empire before Pizarro's invasion. We know from historical sources that early European arrivals on the South American continent led to the spread of these Western diseases and that these diseases penetrated the Inca Empire several years prior to the actual conquest itself. One can only imagine, based on accounts, for example, of the Black Plague in Europe, what these kinds of epidemics can mean in terms of the survival um, of a culture or of an empire. When Pizarro arrived on the shores of Peru, he found thousands of Incas dead and dying of diseases, European diseases. The emperor himself had died. Civil war had broken out between two rivals for the throne. It is possible that if Pizarro had arrived one year earlier, he and his men might have been crushed by Inca armies. But the Spaniards arrived just in time to exploit the situation, and they found that some of the Inca subjects were more than willing to help them. For nearly a century, the Incas had demanded labor and tribute from their subjects, and had taken their children to be sacrificed to the Inca gods. Unbelievable as it may seem, the Spaniards were often welcomed as the lesser of two evils. We know that there was an enormous desire to throw off the Inca yoke, so that the Spanish invasion was seen by many non-Inca ethnic groups as an opportunity to regain their independence. Various native populations sided with the Spaniards and in most of the battles that were crucial for the Spanish conquest, most of the soldiers who were fighting were in fact native Andean armies, basically with small numbers of Spanish participating. Pizarro kidnapped Atahualpa, one of the rivals for the imperial throne. 
Atahualpa tried to buy his life with gold, which the Incas called Sweat of the Sun. The golden treasures of the Sun temples were offered to Pizarro. Pizarro melted them down and murdered Atahualpa anyway. There was desperate fighting for years to come, but in the end, the Incas were vanquished by Spanish might and lethal diseases from across the sea. Their new masters transformed them into laborers and Christians. The ancient prophecy was fulfilled. But as the Spaniards plundered the Inca Empire's wealth, one of its treasures eluded them. They never discovered Machu Picchu, a fact which continues to puzzle scholars. Some believe that soon after the Spanish arrived, Machu Picchu was abandoned by a troubled Inca nobility which could no longer visit its serene mountain retreat. The moment that the Inca power structure was toppled by the Spaniards, a site like Machu Picchu became a total anomaly. It became unjustified. So I suspect that the abandonment of Machu Picchu um, occurred very shortly after Pizarro's um, capture of Atahualpa, and it simply at first was no longer reoccupied by the elite and the retainers, and gradually the retainers began to leave it as they no longer received support to maintain it, and the ruins simply began to um, collapse and become overgrown. 400 years have passed since the Spanish invaded Latin America and Machu Picchu was abandoned. And yet, the Inca people have endured. Today, they still farm the fields of their ancestors high in the Andes. In Cusco, their ancient capital, the rainbow flag of the Inca Empire flies side by side with the modern flag of Peru. The Incas continue to preserve the memory of their past and to celebrate a culture which has been battered by the blows of history. Their masterpiece of beauty, hidden for so long, is famed throughout the world. Perhaps, if we could stand among these ancient Andean peaks, among these ancient stones, we too might sense the unseen forces that so many visitors seem to feel. There's a, a consciousness here that I don't experience any other place. And I think a lot of people around the world feel that when they come here. And I think it, it represents hope that if enough people feel this, that um, we can change, um, change the world. Perhaps it's not important to know exactly what happened here. Maybe it's for us to recreate the meaning of Machu Picchu for ourselves, for this day, for us, for our needs. Perhaps other cities are still lying hidden deep in the jungles of the Andes. Maybe someday archaeologists will discover them. But for now, Machu Picchu stands alone, one of the world's most beautiful places and a haunting mystery that seems to touch the soul.